So, 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 Brett, do you think we're? Uh, what do you think? We're, yeah, we're, let's let's kick it off. I think we're ready to to get started. We always get started about five after to let people get uh, into the room, and uh, yeah, I think you're we're good to go. So, okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Brett. Good to be here with uh, Brett, the healthcare disruptor, and also uh, our advocate the, and proponent and change agent for community wellness. And then Dr. Bob Levine, our renowned brain researcher and expert in drug-free pain elimination. And then I'm Tim Daniels, your wellness plan manager and expert in the PEMF technology that supports things as well. Okay. And we form right now the group we call Well Wave Now. What Well Wave Now is about is bringing wellness to America. You know, I've uh, as part of my work, I work with a lot of healthcare practitioners, and I'm always I'm not always surprised any longer, but I'm always kind of astounded at that every healthcare provider I go into, that those rooms are jam packed with people. Um, and, and most of their being, so mainly they're addressing health conditions. And, and so uh, part of our mission is to do what well, we'd love to see those rooms empty, except for people coming in for their checkups and the preventative work, but certainly reduce those and show people how to collab how to work hand in hand with those healthcare providers to achieve wellness, which is but goes back in the performance. It goes into performance, going into um, satisfaction, goes beyond the disease state into overall well-being. And so that's what we're about here at WellWave now is doing that, trying to do that one individual at a time as we can through things like our discussion today, but also um, like we you might have heard a little dialogue with Philomena, who is uh, very good in the dietary. Uh, world and, and food as medicine and nutrition and working with those providers to enable them to get their message out and to help others. So that's what Wall Wave Now is about, uh, and helping the, in the individual basis, helping practitioners that can uh, create that wave of wellness, getting them the audience and the help they need. And, and then also uh, just getting that out to the, you know, changing their overall distribution of wellness and wellness in America. Is that, Brett, Bob, is that fair? Anything else you, you two would like to add to that? I couldn't no, add no. one thing to that. That's great. Thanks, Tim. All right. Thank you. And so today we're focusing on uh, hypertension. And it just struck us as we were talking. And it, it, now that's some astounding so the statistics. Throw those out a little bit. Where I saw that um, you know, so the Center for Diseases Control, and I think it was the American Heart Association and others, were showing that there were almost 48% of Americans over the age of 20 had hypertension. So it was, but it's estimates were like 112, 109 million, 112 million about on that. That's just a phenomenal amount. And then of that, I was saying that even astounding more was that 78% uh, of those who knew they had hypertension didn't have it under control. Uh, and there are many, and, and, and given how hypertension can affect people, even if they have it for six months, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but even six months of hypertension can be very damaging. So that really, said we told us we wanted to try and do, start doing something about that. And, and then it even struck us more that there was still a, a, a high percentage of people of the estimate that had hypertension that didn't even realize they had it for one reason or another. Okay. So those are the things that really said, we've got to try as part of this well wave, uh, you know, keep our eye on hypertension more than an eye on it, take some steps to try and help people out in that regard. Okay. So well, yeah. go ahead, Bob. I was just going to say high blood pressure is considered one of the main silent killers because people don't feel it. They don't know they have it. Uh, and then it comes on and then, you know, strokes happen and heart attacks happen. Uh, so it's really important that people keep an eye on what's going on with their cardiovascular system, their heart, their blood pressure, things like that. Really important. Yeah. And and that was, that was kind of the subtitle to our, uh, you know, our, well, I think it was, I can't remember if the subtitle of primary tab, we said unmasking a silent killer. And that's really that's really what it is, because it's not until often not until late stages the symptoms the symptoms show up. Uh, yet your damage is being done that can really cause you to, to have those things you talk about, Bob, heart, you know, heart attack, stroke, damage to kidneys, and other things, but even very early, very early in the cycle, less than six months, those things can stop start happening to you. Okay. Yeah, I wish I I wish I knew uh, back uh, 1980. In 1984, when my father died of a massive heart attack, giving a lecture uh, in Northwestern University, if I, I had no, I didn't, I wasn't versed in all the things I know now about how to help him. 
uh, yeah. it would be great to help him, but uh, you know, he just he he had it, he wasn't watching it careful enough, and boy, mm -hmm. it took him down fast. Right. It was really sad. Yeah. And then, and that's it. Yep, and sorry that sorry sorry you had to experience that. Certainly sorry that, that he went went through that. And that's the other part. So much of this, especially with hypertension, can be is preventable. And that's what we want to kind of get into. And part of to me, part of that first uh, part of prevention is having that awareness that you have it. You know, there's there's a reason why every time you go, you know. Um, I won't drag everybody in through why, but you know, recently I've I've been seeing all kinds of doctors here in the past year, both uh, personally and then professionally. And when I see them personally, every time I go in, they take that blood pressure. Now, yes, sometimes it's just to check for that hypertension, uh, but also it's to give indications of whether or not something else is going on in the body that could be an indication of it or of damage has been done. But there's a reason why they uh, look at that so much. And for um, and so certainly, but you know, most people will see that physician uh, once once a year on their on their health check. That's too long, in, in my opinion. I want your opinion, Breck and Bob. Too long, in my opinion, for the go in between those uh, those uh, checking that blood pressure. What do you what do you think, Breck? Yeah, I know it's it's something you know, especially as you start to get up in age, that you should be checking on a regular basis, right? Um, because it is an indicator of other things going on, uh, stress even, uh, right? So if you're if you're living with a little bit more stress than usual, um, check that blood pressure because it is that sneaky one that that kind of sneaks up on you and can cause other problems if it's if it's left unchecked too long, right? Dr. Bob gave an example. I have the same example with my you know grandfather um, that uh, you know died way 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 too young uh, and. It was a combination of things. It wasn't just that he had a, a heart attack. It was what led up to it and his lifestyle, right, that that uh, that led up to that. And then one major event of him overexerting himself, which would be something fairly normal, you know, um, uh, somebody in normal health condition would have been able to survive just fine. But uh, but he uh, he didn't survive because of his his lifestyle and everything yeah. that led up to that uh, that heart attack. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we, when we talk about chronic pain, we talk about some people say, "I just bent over to pick up the newspaper and my back was shot." And you know, yeah. well, it's, it, you know, it, it, was it really just bending over picking it up, or was there a lot of were there a lot of underlying factors that developed over the course of decades that led to that one event? Same with high blood pressure. You know, oh, I just had a massive heart attack. What happened? Well, it all happened in the decades before that massive heart attack, really. Yeah. So it's important Absolutely. to keep an eye on. I think everybody ought to have a blood pressure, uh, you know, cuff, blood pressure monitoring system at home. And they can do that, you know, at least once a week, just checking out. It's really worthwhile. Same with, uh, you know, blood uh, oxygen levels. It's really important. To, and those are inexpensive things to buy, you know. That's right. You know, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, right, I'm right with you, Dr. Bob, on that because I actually, now I'll preface this a little bit. I was going to, I, I do a, so I recommend to all my clients when I do wellness plan management, but I take my own advice and I do it for myself. And how I got into, got into it most recently was I mentioned going to see all those doctors. And every time I went in, I've got what's called lab coat syndrome. Pick that up late in life where you get, I get in there and I get scared. I'm always worried. I, now I'll, I'll admit it. I'm a, even though I'm a macho Nebraskan, it's not fair to do that. I get scared when I go to see those doctors. I always pray, think I'm going to hear something bad from them say it's finally hit, finally hitting me. And my blood pressure and, and pulse shoots way up there it'll get up there like one that's gone up to 150 on the blood flow i mean what's that the stolic part of the top one yeah and uh, and it's been yeah. up to 150 on that and things but pulse has been pulse has been up at 140 and they always want to send me to go get a stress stress test they said well boy you got you got this fat rapid heartbeat they call it tachycardia and they yeah. said, you've got that. And what's changing here? Have you had a stress test? What are we going to send you a stress test? We ever sent you to a cardiologist? And I'm sitting there saying, boy, you know, I, I swim, I work out. When I lift, it doesn't bother me. I sit at home, I can tell you. I take my resting pulse rate, you know, three times a week. I can tell you that that's usually between 56 and 62. I can tell they don't believe it. So I finally went out and I and I followed my own advice that I've been giving to others. And I bought a, a blood pressure monitor you just mentioned. It cost me $63 off of Amazon, all it is. And I did exactly, <laughs> exactly what I talked to my clients about as I helped them achieve their own optimal wellness of planning. I did my own baseline, taking it every day for two weeks. Now, 
and I'll let you come in here, Bob, a little bit because I'm good because you always talk to me. You, you always queried me when I first got it. Did you do it correctly? Have you done that? So I want you to tell people how to take that correctly. But I took it, established my baseline over two weeks. And so now I go in and I show them, you know, this is what it's like. And I calibrated it and had it taken. I went in and had my, my last appointment. I had, they took, they took the blood pressure there. They took it on. I took mine in, which I recommend, showed the same blood pressure. And I said, now here's, you know, here's my average. Okay. Now, now Bob, so, so you always, you're, you're like uh, Ronald Reagan in the CIA. You trust, but verify. So I told you, I take my blood pressure and you started saying, well, how do you take it Tim? And so yeah. what's, what's the correct way to establish? Uh, I, I don't know if there's, there's probably the, the, probably the worst way to take it is uh, right after you've been vigorously moving around, whatever you've been doing, and then, you know, pop on the blood pressure uh, cuff and take it immediately and get your blood, your blood pressure is 140 over 95. Drink, drink, think you have drink a bunch pressure. of coffee or Red Bull yeah. first too. Also. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I, 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 every, most everything I do in life involves an N of three, in other words, three trials. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whatever, because an N of one is just, you don't know, it could be aberrant. It could be way off the mark. So I, I usually take three, um, blood pressure uh, measures. And also I don't take the first one. I relax myself, sit down for a few minutes, make sure I'm really relaxed or when I get up in the morning, I'm not, I haven't been running around. So I'll, I'll sit down, I'll take my blood pressure three times and I'll record it just to see what it is uh, and make sure that everything is in, you know, where, it, where it ought to be. And uh, so that's what it is for me. It's an end of three, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it three times. If I'm doing blood pressure, blood sugar, I'm going to do it. I might do that one twice. And if they're the same, I'm fine. But if you have one high, one low, one up, one down, the third one really gets you, you know, to know where you, where your average is. So yeah. that's, that's what I say. And Tim, I'm sure you do it perfectly. I think <laughs> you're, you're, you're a stickler for detail. Well, well, yes, but there are a couple other things that you checked to make sure I was doing too, Dr. Bob, which was you take you take it in the morning. And I also added, you post it, you, you take, you, know, you should take it at the same time each day. And I, and the, and the ex, the most recommended time is to take it when you get up in the morning and after you urinate it, then take your blood pressure, blah, 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 that. And I was taking it twice and Bob said three times. I said, well, maybe I'll do three, but twice is good enough for me. So <laughs> that's that. Well, if you get two identicals, you're good. Right. right. Yeah. And that's yeah. good. And it, yeah. then, it, then, it, then you remember that Brecky had nerve enough to say, well, Tim, are you taking it standing or seated? I, I, I said, yes, Bob, I take it, seat it, and I take it when I'm supported like you're supposed to. <laughs> so, but it was, good, it was good verification there. But yeah, so, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So, well, Tim, one thing I wanted to add to what you said at the beginning, I just thought of it, is that you talked about uh, the United States of America. And I'm saying we got to get this information out to the world because when yeah. you look at the globe, there's so many people that have high blood pressure. Why is that? So we should talk a little bit about that at some point. And I want to talk about, I want to say for one thing, everybody out there should know high blood pressure is reversible right. nearly all the time. Okay. So yeah. if, you do, if you do the right things, you make the right changes, have the right orientation to your health, high blood pressure is reversible. And I could tell some stories about that. I just want to bring that up Right. Now, right. Lead into yeah, that. So, so let's let's, let's uh, come back. I want to uh, let's make sure we come back to those that causes and the why a little bit. Uh, but I'll then let's you know Brett. I can see Brett getting anxious and ready because you know Brett's a lifestyle person. And right when you said this reversible, I can see Brett was ready to the talk. So Brett, go go right ahead. Well, I just I just wanted to make sure that I welcomed everybody new that was that was joining live on uh, TikTok too. As people pop in and pop out, they don't come and just stay like we do on Zoom, but but we welcome everybody that, that's just joined us. We're uh, having a, a lively discussion about hypertension and high blood pressure and and uh, and that it is reversible you uh, in most cases. And and so that's you know, that's kind of one of my areas of, of focus, right, is is the wellness side uh, of healthcare and trying to to find uh, solutions without um, going directly to medication. Medication may be the right solution, but Try, try other options first, if you can, because medications also come with so many side effects. And that's why people follow my content on, uh, on TikTok is because of those scary drug facts that I talk about. So, you know, some of the solutions that, that, that we all know about, right? The number one thing that comes to mind is everybody should know this, right? Stop smoking if you're smoking, right? That's that's going to be a big, uh, you know, elevator of, of blood pressure is is uh, smoking. 
I can see you're saying going to say something, Tim. Let me let me turn the screen well, back around. Uh, you, you you know you're down in my the state of my birthplace, uh, Breck, the healthcare disruptor, and you know Breck, and you know that the uh, smoky is not the only way that tobacco is used down there in Arizona. So I thought I just want to say, you know, give give them the other way, that other thing they have to have to stop if they are uh, not. The other type of tobacco use they have to stop as well. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any tobacco use, and then you know, obviously, alcohol. Too too much alcohol uh, is a contributor. It goes back to, you know, my personal experience with my my grandfather, my dad's dad. You know, and why we don't. Well, I didn't get to spend very much time with him. He passed when I was really young, like three, four years old, and it was his lifestyle, right? A lot of tobacco use, uh, and. Um, uh, he used to to have those little uh, licorice mint things that he would try to cover up his his breath whenever the grandkids came over, and then of course al alcohol use were were the two number one contributing factors. Salt, you know, overuse of salt, table salt, um, or too many processed foods that have a lot of uh, of salt in them. That's another thing that that should be pretty well known, right? That that's there's been a lot of studies. Uh, that people should be aware of just those those really minor things. But then what are some of the good things that you can do, right? And and that's where you get into the nutrition of, of eating, you know, a more uh, healthy, uh, balanced diet of, of whole foods, you know, fruits, vegetables, um, whole grains. Uh, don't uh, underestimate nuts and seeds. I mean, one of my favorite snacks is is uh, snacking on, you know, on nuts and, and seeds. Um, because there's so many good benefits, and including some of those natural nut oils that you're getting uh, out of the out of the the nuts and seeds as well. So, I, I can see that uh, Dr. Bob probably has something to say about that. How did you know I said this? <laughs> Ready to jump out of my chair here. Right, but, but before, before, but right before you do, Bob. Sorry, because you know it's it's my mistake. I gotta make up for it again. I just get so anxious to get into the discussion here that I often neglect to tell tell people. You know, if they've got questions, you know, throw you know, please throw them in. Pre bring bring them out. Um, if you know you're on whatever forum you're on, get them you know get them to us. We'll try to try to address them here in next uh, next few minutes because we only say we officially go half hour but then we do stay an extra up to an extra half hour to answer people's question so sorry for that interruption bob i just did want to get that out to make people show that uh, you know, they can interact with us and don't have to wait if they face so choose to yeah I'm, I'm glad you said that tim uh, yeah put the questions in the chat and we'll get right to it so one of the one of the factors i want to talk about is something that i've discovered over the last 20 some years of working with people with high blood pressure uh is that um the, the, the blood blood pressure is a result of what they call peripheral vascular resistance. It's a fancy way of saying that the small uh, capillaries and blood vessels um, have a lot of resistance. Well, the question is, why do they have so much resistance? One of the primary factors that I've found over the years is that you can have the, the muscles can be in excess contraction. When the muscles are contracting, they're squeezing down the blood vessels, creating that resistance. And then that's why in my opinion, that's why a lot of people will take blood pressure medications, a lot of them sometimes, and they won't be controlled because you, if you're compressing with your muscles down on those blood vessels through stress reactions, automatic stress reactions, whatever it happens to be, uh, those, there's no way the drugs are going to be able to adequately open those up. So I had a woman and one, I used to run group programs, I still do on occasion, uh, with hundreds of people at a time, and, and I led from the stage, and I would tell people, you know, look, you're, you're going to be using guided meditation for relaxation. You're going to use effective muscle release to release muscles that are in excess contraction from the top of your head to the tips of your toes. And as you do this, you have to monitor, you know, whatever drugs you're taking, you monitor what the drugs are for. If you're taking high blood pressure medication, monitor your blood pressure. So I had a woman who was uh, one, 145 over 95 with fully medicated with a bunch of, with several different uh, blood pressure meds on board, meaning that she was on uh, not controllable, right? But they were just bringing it down. And uh, she, uh, so I told her, I said, look, you got to monitor your blood pressure. And, you know, if you see changes, get to your doctor. So after three sessions in the program, she uh, uh, called me up and said, you know, and all the time she's doing effective muscle release to release muscles and excess contraction. She's doing guided meditation to relax and de stress. And she called me up and said, Dr. Bob, um, you know, I just took my blood pressure, uh, it was it was 90 over 60, you know, from 145 over 95, 90 over 60. 
and I went to my doctor and they saw the change. They didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. and it, it, the thing is, if she kept going the way she was going, her blood pressure, she, she might have, she could have died. I mean, anything could have happened, you know, certainly passed out. Um, so I just told her, you got to get with your doctor immediately and have them tell them what's going on. If they don't do something, go to the emergency room. You got to get this thing taken care of. You need dosage adjustment. And I, I had plenty of people who were able to get off their blood pressure meds because once they release the muscles in, in their arms and their legs, they could you know, release the muscles uh, of excess contraction. The blood vessels would open up. The blood flow would be uh, unencumbered like it was before. And the one thing That's I can true. say, if you, if you have a blood pressure monitor, do this test. Get yourself stabilized and calm. Take your blood pressure three times, maybe two if you get the identical ones, right, Tim? And then, uh, and then what you do is when you're sitting there, just contract all of the skeletal muscles. You can contract your arms, your chest, your abdominals, your your leg uh, leg muscles, and check your after one minute, check your blood pressure. And I guarantee you, it'll be if you're normally let's say 120 over 80, you're going to be 140 to 50 over 100, easy. And then you. And what I do is I tell people, okay, then once you do that, take a breath, relax yourself, just let it go, and then take one more minute and we'll see, we'll see it come down. That tells me that excess muscle contraction can affect blood pressure in a big way. So I just wanted people to understand that. And so when I put my contact information in the, uh, in the chat, so if anybody wants to have further conversations about this, if you know somebody who's got uncontrolled hypertension, let's chat and contact Breck, me, or Tim. And uh, we can have some conversations with you about. All that. right, beautiful. And I do want I want to come back to that. You got a key thing there, like we talked talked earlier about that. Uh, no, I mentioned earlier that uh, even in six months, you can do a lot of damage to a lot of parts of the body. So getting that immediate relief, drugs or otherwise, can be key. And you point out a couple of things there for immediate relief. So I want to come back to that. But I also want to now. There are a couple of couple of questions that came up. I want to make sure we address. Um, so one was, you know, we you mentioned we mentioned taking the blood pressure two to three times. If two don't match up, take it the third time. Uh, one question was, is there a amount of is there a minimum amount of time that you want to wait in be in between taking the next the the taking the blood pressure again? You have thoughts on that, Bob? Brock or Bob? You're on mute. You're on mute, Brock or Bob. The key is to have yourself be, you know be stable relaxed, breathing, and just calm yourself down. You want to get yourself to a basal calm rate. I usually say five minutes. Five minutes is usually long enough for somebody to relax. Right. And also, because I do a lot with teacher visioning, it's important to teacher vision that your blood pressure is so low, it's wonderful. In the yeah, perfect my, my recommendation always is to, to you know take that big deep breath in through your nose, let it out slowly out through your mouth, do that two or three times completely calm calms yourself down uh, like dr bob is suggesting and then retake your blood pressure right and the only thing i would add add to that is that it's good to um clench raise your arm clench and unclench your fist while you're taking that deep breath a little bit a couple of times because that blood can't because of the contraction of the cup up there it can contract it and keep some lack of non-medical term trap some blood up there that can throw the measurement off. So you want to make sure that gets out of that. Now, the other thing was, there's a quite question um, question out here um, on, we talk about seeds and nuts as being good part of the diet to help with, is do we have any thoughts on what types of seed, what types of seeds and nuts are, are good, good to take? Uh, yeah, for me, it's all of them. All of them are great, right? If you don't don't have an allergy, um, it's natural. Uh, what we get in trouble with is getting all the flavored uh, nuts that have extra bunch of, of salt or, yeah. or honey or sugar or something on it, you know, coating on it. So, um, you know, my my one of my favorite snacks is I just get those baking almonds, a big bag of those baking unsalted uh, almonds from uh, you know from Costco and and that's that's kind of my my daily snack is a couple of handfuls of those but um, but yeah it, um, sunflower seeds pumpkin seeds are, are great um, uh, enjoy those and mixing those in my my yogurt parfaits in the morning with some mm -hmm. fresh uh, berries. All right. So keep, keep keep in mind also that the seeds themselves are great and they have fiber. It's the seed oils that are. 
Uh, it's, it's the seed oil. There's certain seed oils that are that are not 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 helpful for health. And I don't remember all the details about that. I have to look it up. But I come across that all the time. Yeah, you would you would have to eat a a, a truckload to really get anything too uh, toxic. But I mean, there's there's even studies on on um, how Brazil nuts can can actually lower your your bad cholesterol. Uh, there's just not a big you know, a uh, um, lobbying firm behind Brazil nut growers to, to bring that up so that everybody knows that little little uh, tidbit. But it's a pretty interesting fact that, uh, that yeah, you you know, you, you don't want to eat, you know, it's moderation in all things. You don't want to overindulge in any one thing. Um, and, and that's the same with Brazil nuts. You wouldn't want to eat, you know, a, a whole bag of them every day because you're th trying to lower cholesterol. No, you'd, you'd get some other things from from the nut that isn't as good for you that your your body already produces. Right, it's probably worth talking a little bit about statins. But when you say uh, just because uh, they're so prevalent, I mean it's more than half the country on statins. I mean it's a, the number is astronomical. And yeah. uh, you know what really bugs me about statins, the whole statin thing, is that well, number one, they're showing that the side effects, long term side effects from statins, are problematic. So as there are as they as, as the, the, there are problems with most long-term pharmaceuticals. The stat, the, the level of statin, the normal level of statin was considered to be 240 many years ago. And now it just keeps coming down and down and down. And I'm sure it's, you know, pardon my conspiracy theory business here, but I'm sure it's an effort to get more and more people onto statins, right? So they keep lowering the, the, the level. My mother had a, had a cholesterol level of over 300 her whole life and she never took a statin. And she died at 84 of lung cancer because, of course, if you're smoking that long, you know, sure. you might get bit. Right. So, yeah, so I'd like to, I want to tie that back to something else we were talking about. Well, one, that um, everybody might not completely understand the time between statins and hypertension, but it's it's there as well because the statins are usually taken to try and uh, an attempt to lower cholesterol. Well, cholesterol gets in to the art as part of that hardening the robberies, increasing that, that that tension in there, that more resistance we can drive hypertension as, as well. Hence why it's part of that whole cardiovascular stuff the doctors want, want to do with us as part of that. That that said, where I want to also tie that in is something where we talked about um, you know other types of I think Brad was mentioning, you guys were mentioning getting on the blood pressure medication uh, if we needed to we did it. We know we did something earlier on a few few interactive podcast sessions before. Uh, we talked about how do you communicate with your healthcare provider, and I think you know Breck Breck can put that uh, has the link to go listen to replays and things of that nature. But part of that, what I want to know, because there have been a couple times in, in you know my life where my doctor wanted to put me on statins, and uh, and I had the had the, had the conversation. They would say you're borderline high blood pressure. It's the right communication, which is said, I, you know, I, I didn't ever, uh, actually, I went on the statin for about two or three weeks, got off that, said, no, I'm getting it down another way. But the communication with that doctor was, you know, I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I'm feel I'm relatively young here. And I was at the time, I was probably 38, she wanted to put me on. And I said, I don't want to be on this long term. My objective is to get, is to get off this. You know, how, do, if I get on this, how do we get off that? How do we, how do we work off it? I think it's called the medical term, I think, is titrate off of it. How do we try to titrate off of that? Um, am I locked into this forever on this? And I think that's the type of dialogue. Um, if you if you want to go on the medic on the high pressure medication or on the statins, I think that's the type of dialogue to have with that healthcare provider as well. Uh, Brett, uh, yeah, you know? I'm, I you know I'm always going to say, hey, let's let's try everything else first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the doctor prescribes it, they pres they prescribe it, right? But why not try a supplement, right? You may need, you may be low in potassium. You may need uh, more, um, uh, you know, omega threes. You may need more, you know, fatty acids. Um, uh, you, you need more magnesium. So there's there's certain supplements that can also be very beneficial in lowering blood, uh, you know, blood pressure without going immediately to a, a medication that you can start to become dependent upon. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's, you know, uh, in one of my past lives, I ran a home care agency for the elderly. And so as part of that, that we were working up the care plan for that um, elderly person in conjunction with their doctors, we would look at, you know, how, how can we manage this blood pressure in, in other ways 
either to reduce that amount of medication or get off of it. And, and that's a number of the things that you, you mentioned there. You mentioned there Brett. Now, uh, along those lines, uh, Dr. Bob got into earlier, uh, you know, that muscle. You'll, you'll have to give me the proper term for it again, Bob, but I'll call it the muscle contraction stuff. That uh, where that could excess, you, excess muscle contraction, excess, excess muscle, muscle contraction. contraction. You know, to me, uh, so I want to go back up to that point of um, where we said even in six months, you can do a lot of damage to yourself if you got hypertension. So to me, there are also key things to, to take, try and take advantage of to get immediate relief on that, even on an intermissive basis, that you get that baseline down. So I think the work you talked about. And release and that contraction is good. You know, I just I think there are other things that can other things that I know I can done that I've worked on with both in my home care world and as a wellness plan manager for people helping people achieve their optimal wellness is like your future visioning, other parts of other meditation, the visioning that can get that down. Uh, hot, uh, surprisingly to some people, and it's all because it increases that sort of uh, uh, blood flow and they're releasing it. Warm baths can do it. Saunas can do it. Things of that nature. So you know, I won't belabor it because as a uh, there, there's a person on with us who often says, Tim, you know, I, this is information that can be Googled. So I'm not going to go down that path too long, but I just want to let people know, yes, there is information you can get out there and find uh, that's there to, that you can get immediate relief in there in addition to working with Bob. Go ahead, Bob. Well, I just wanted to say, uh, when we're talking about high blood pressure and all the different factors that can feed into high blood pressure, one of them, uh, one of the main factors, I think, are the repetitive movements that people do every day. Uh, the average person takes between 30,000 and 50,000 repetitive movements every day, and most people are doing those incorrectly. And so one of the major uh, movements that, that is done every day is, prop is walking. And most people are not walking properly. And when you, when you think about how the cardiovascular system works, if somebody's standing up all the time, not moving around, the blood and, and, and fluid is going to pool in the, in the feet and the ankles, right? That's what leads to edema or swelling of the feet and ankles. And if somebody doesn't walk properly, if they're walking very flat-footed and, and uh, they can actually not allow that calf muscle to pump, which is the major return uh, of blood to the heart. The calf muscle provides that major pumping return of blood to the heart. And so improper walking is a big deal. I always tell people who I work with that if I train you how to walk properly and I train you how to de-stress and relax, you're likely to have high blood pressure. You're likely to be out of it soon enough. And there's other things too, like effective muscle release that I do in other, other uh, modalities. But um, the repetitive movements of daily living and proper walking are so important and it's just not going for a walk or walking your 10,000. I mean, walking 20,000 steps a day, walking them improperly is not necessarily going to make the difference when it comes to uh, relieving high blood pressure from pooling of blood in the, uh, in the legs. Right. And the other thing right. we should probably do in another session is talk about an inflammation diet. Yeah. Because that's yeah. a big factor too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we should continue that. And, uh, you know, Breck, I know, I'm going to come to you because I know you you do a lot of exercise and, we're gonna, and I know you do it properly. So I want you to comment on what type of exercise that you you advocate for this um, well, lowering of, of uh, hypertension. But before we do that, you know, Diana has had her hand up patiently. So I want to bring Diana in to ask her question of us. Well, well thank you. Uh, and the word factors uh, keys in a few things with me. And one of them is the whole awareness piece of just how, as a culture, we don't even think of testing our blood pressure. I mean, if we don't feel well and we're catching a cold, we get a thermometer and we take our fever. It's like that's we, we grew up in a situation where we immediately go to the thermometer. If we have a fever, then that puts us that maybe that's when we need to call the doctor. And we, we don't use um, any type of a measurement or, or do, I mean, it's, I'm asking a question. I don't believe we're taught, it's an awareness thing to even test high blood pressure. And the question of environment is another piece of this. I just happened to write an article 
ha that had to do with work workforce stresses and challenges. And some of the statistics in terms of what people suffer in the workforce uh, are kind of very disconcerting in terms of 87% of employees are faced at least with one mental health challenge the past year. And 65% of employees have experienced mental health stressors that negatively impact their work performance. And that's an increase from of 35% since 2020. So the question for me is, one of the questions is, what is it in the environment that triggers all of this? And the second piece of that is if people are aware of that, then perhaps that will shift them into this um, care of them, self-care to do something about their blood pressure to at least test for it. So I, 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 I'm, I'm concerned that as a culture, probably global, we, we don't even think of perhaps I'm not feeling well, I have a headache, my heart is racing, maybe it's my blood pressure. And that doesn't even exist for us. So I just wanted to raise that as an issue. Really, really insightful uh, comment because it is, you know, it's it's it starts at a very young age, just even with the processed foods that we're attracted to, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of it starts with that, and and then, you know, you bring bring up the the thought about you know maybe the headache has something to do with it. Also, hydration, proper hydration, could have a lot to do with it too right with with having um headaches and and so there's so many things to consider but uh it's it's almost a learned behavior from when we were young that man man those chips are delicious you know those processed foods that snacks that that, that are available to you uh, kind of get us on that um less healthy uh lifestyle that then just starts to build up and add up in in, in our systems as we get older and start to to experience some of these these warning signs. Good, mm -hmm. Diana. I think your point about uh, the fact that we uh, take our temperature, uh, even though with the way the body heals is to, for the body's temperature to rise. So as long as the body's temperature doesn't rise too high, you know, we want to let it go. We don't want to bring it down. That's how the body heals. And uh, so we, but but yet everybody takes their temperature. So the, I think it really needs to start with the conventional healthcare system with the physicians, where physicians ought to be taught and told that hey, this is really important that people check it, they can monitor it, we can save a lot of people's lives just by uh, monitoring it. So, and everybody yeah. goes to their position for all kinds of visits, wellness visits, sick visits, whatever it is. So I think it's got to start there, really. Right. And I'll, and I'll, I'm going to tap into Philomena here in a second, but I'm going to make a comment here because, you know, we, we have Bernard with us here. And Bernard is always, it's been before he jumps in and beats us up again, he always likes us to say, you know, you get how, how early should this really start and who should we all getting all this? And so I've learned my lesson from Bernard in his last interaction with us. Exactly. <laughs> there he is. He's with us. Yeah. <laughs> and it really, and somehow we also have to, as part of our mission, get this into the schools. I remember taking, even uh, probably in elementary school, certainly, and it was junior high for me, certainly in middle school. They, they, you know, they gave us. Um, you started getting into the, you know, the health courses. Well, it ought to be taught in there. Part of this is not just what your systems are. But we need to get that out in terms of talking about, uh, you know, what is this self-care? How do you perform this self-care? What is right to monitor and how do you do it over, over time on that? Now, that's also, because that's not there, that's also part of what I do as a wellness plan manager when I help people to work with them hand-in-hand -hand to achieve their optimal wellness. I often say that's like, I give two analogies on that to save time. It's, it's like a general contractor for your health is what I'm doing on that. Working with people like Bob, the healthcare providers, and personal trainer, bringing it all together and mapping out how do you get to your, your the state of wellness you want. But I'm, and so, I'm like a general contractor or what a financial manager does for you on from your finances side. But unlike a finance financial manager, I don't want to be with you forever. And so, I do a knowledge transfer and teach them how to do that self care for themselves using the tools, the techniques, and the methods to do so because uh, you know that self care is just so important. I as um, you know, having been 
a a decent athlete. You know, when I was when I was young, I played. I was the only one I was never good at, but I did it was gymnastics. But I stayed with gymnastics through in high school a little bit. Uh, side of Palmer horse is the one, but you know, I played baseball, second base, and pitched. I uh, uh, played football for a while, missed the football genes. My dad was a semi pro football player, and my nephew played on Notre Dame's national champion team. But then I did go on at least get a scholarship from wrestling. So, why do I bring all, all up? Because there is, is in that environment, you do get some self care teaching to, to an extent. Modern, you know, what's your what's your, what's your pulse? How do you recover? Recover from that? What's your breathing like? You've taken that, so that really kind of started me on a path on that that I didn't, you know, took uh, took further over time. Brett, do you want to say something? Then we got to get to Philomena and Bernard. If it, if it... No, I was just going to make sure that you you recognize that we have some other hands up. Okay, I think I think Philomena came on came up first. So go ahead, Philomena. Maybe I should let Bernard go off it because you people say he's a top guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so feeling so, Philomena, you're saying that it's easy to follow Bernard because he's a top guy, right? Yeah, yeah yes. <laughs> you people I'm sure, talk I'm sure, about I'm so, sure you'll okay. define Philomena. Okay. So uh I like the discussion. I really like the discussion. And uh, what I wanted to ask is. If you like, is it Brack? Your name, I only see healthcare disrupts. I don't see your name. Mm -hmm. So he said something about when you're taking the blood pressure, you take deep breath, the breath, you relax. And then Dr. Bob said something about your muscle, relaxing your muscle. So my question is when you do that, when you're taking your blood pressure. So it can influence the blood pressure at a time. But after that, how do you maintain that? Great question. I, I could address that. Yep. So that's a great question. Um, how do you maintain lower a lower blood pressure after you relax yourself with breath and you relax your muscles and you take your blood pressure and then bam, you go back into your life and everything starts, uh, starts up again. It's like revs up. So th when, when I teach interrupting automatic stress reactions for people when you interrupt an automatic stress reaction it doesn't matter what you're doing how active you are you're able to interrupt that automatic stress reaction which leads to hypercontracted muscles and all kinds of postural distortions and, and other related related events so interrupting the automatic stress reactions is very important and then when you tra train your muscles to release through effective muscle release routines that, that I've developed and that I teach. Um, when the muscles learn how to release, they stay released, they stay relaxed. So, so that, that allows you to go through your day and you can take your blood pressure uh, any time during the day and you'll find that the blood pressure is relatively normal. So um, that's, that's how you do it. I help people do it through interrupting these automatic processes, these automatic uh, reactions through, through stress and uh, automatic reactions uh, that lead to excess neuromuscular contraction. Right. Yeah, so Bob, I agree, agree with you that interruption and how to do it is good. And then also becomes a, you know, a, a, like uh, Breck, the healthcare disruptor has mentioned in, a couple of times. And what I work on with my clients is, is gonna, uh, basically what you do with this health, with your future visioning and this, uh, you know, that disruption is to work these things into your life daily. Um, you feel, I mean, you're a diet person where well, you just, you, you know, you just can't eat right once a week. It's, you know, <laughs> at, at least five days out of the week, you gotta, you gotta eat right. Uh, and it's the exercise. We talked about exercise a little bit and Breck, I never did come back to you, until a little bit, but um, type you do. So feel free to jump in. But, you know, to me, especially in hypertension, most people think that it's, it's only a lot of people think that the only thing that works in hypertension is the aerobic stuff. But no, if you, if you, the resistance training helps with hypertension because it helps get fat out of the body. Fat is, helps with is higher blood volume and causes the heart to work more on that. So various types of exercise, you know, can help on that. Would you, you agree, Breck? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm anxious to get to Bernard's comment or question as well, since we're running late on time. Yeah. So, uh, Bernard, you have something for us? I know his, ha his hand went down. That was just because uh, we took too long. It yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to uh, follow back up with uh, Diana. I thought 
she made uh, such an excellent um, comment that I wanted to tap in and follow up with what she was talking about because I view it, and, and Tim was talking about this a little bit, I view it a specific type of way. And in, in all actuality, in my opinion, what she's referring to is how do you become efficient, you know, daily efficient, just like you mentioned, Tim. Mm -hmm. And I, I look at it in such a unique way. Um, for instance, when it comes to, you know, your physical well-being, we have went down a path of understanding through time how we view it to be efficient. So we go down that path, us as a culture, we go down that path of understanding, we feel something, we maybe do some research, then we go to a doctor. Um, even when it comes to, you know, graduating school, there's a path to that. There's a path to being efficient in these things, whereas there's a beginning point, middle point, and, you know, a certificate or degree, a, a graduation point, or a way of, you know, the doctor who we expect to actually, uh, relieve of, of that pain or of this scenario that we're in. But when it comes to that mental side, exactly what Dan is talking about, you know, there is nothing, there is no proactive um, kind of fluidity to how we kind of move forward on the mental side. And that's with filling these things internally and understanding them, taking the action. There's no beginning, middle, or end, no direct understood cultural middle beginning and into this that proactive side once again is the place where a lot of people leave alone and they focus when it comes to mentally with reactions mm -hmm. and after this has happened this is what you should do um, when this occurs this is how you should feel this is how you react come see me in this space if you're feeling this way and i think people miss the ball a lot of times on that proactive side to the mental space that we all live in when we go work out, there's a beginning way of working out, and then it gets more intense, and then your body gets used to you, and you are and you're able to work out and train a specific type of way. There's a course to that, you know. There's just no fluidity on that mental side, and I think there should be more dedicated time um, to just the proactive side, which comes with, like Dan is talking about, understanding the stats, teaching, diving into the culture. Um, and, and really teaching and creating a path daily. Like who, what, how do we respond like what you all are talking about on a daily basis? How, what is the definition of daily efficiency when it comes to the mental side? Which is the question that the young lady who left just asked you, you know, well, after I do this test, then what? Well, that's how all she's saying is, how am I on a daily, what do, how do I react and view this on a daily basis? Because nobody knows that. You know, and I think there should be more conversation right there. So I just think the way Dan brought it up was uh, beautiful. But what we're all really saying is proactivity, daily efficiency in all of these different categories and topics right. and subjects. Right. Amen. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, and, you know, I, I might ask Dr. Bob to plug his ears because you know, usually, you know, I don't want to get too big and have, have him thinking that I finally agree with us on things. Oh, my but God. I, I will take it. The, uh, another way of phrasing my, uh, so I'll, 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 I'll take joint credit. Another way of phrasing my daily activity, is Dr. Bob often says, it's got to be a way of being. It's got you know, it's got to be. Uh -huh. And so uh, it, it's, it, you've got to be a, when, you've got to be a self-care person. You have to understand how to do it and learn that, and we can help you with that and others things is out there. And then you've got to make it part of you. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah. I guess I guess maybe this is my um my own therapy. This self interactive podcast is a little bit of therapy for me. I've talked often about how wrestling saved me from a life of obesity, but I still have to watch it. And if if I don't, my wife can weigh once a month. You better be careful there, Tim. You better be careful. <laughs> talking about your wife's weight. <laughs> yeah, stay on track. I work with my clients and tailor it to them. Some of them, you know, it's, it's if they, you know, if they check, if they check once a month, it's fine. If I don't check daily, I get off track. Yeah, because I can I can put on weight like that. There's been times when I missed a week, and the next thing you know. You know, I put on I put on ten pounds because I've just gone off track. To keep myself on that. So, it, why do I say that? Because it's got to be you got to understand. You got you got to have some self awareness. You got to be taught the right self care, but then you got to build it into a customized daily routine for yourself on what to do. Go ahead, Doctor Bob. That's that's excellent, Tim. Yeah, excellent. Um, when when we talk about um, people being overweight, 
there's one thing I want to say about that. People do not have to lose weight to, to get relief from high blood pressure and get off their meds. People do not have to lose weight to relieve chronic pain. It just doesn't have to happen. Now, is losing weight and being lean body mass a great idea? Absolutely. Uh, it's been shown that uh, the, the best longevity is related to lean body mass and little stress. Okay, so if you have little stress and lean body mass, you can live a long time, okay, with, with just a reasonable diet. So uh, it's, there's a lot of reasons to lose weight, of course, but you don't. Have, but I want to I want to bust the myth that you have to lose weight to re relieve your blood pressure. That you have to lose weight to get out of pain. That you have to lose weight for just about anything. The only thing I can think of where you have to lose weight is maybe if you are carrying a lot of extra weight and your joints are hurting because of the excess weight. It's like right. if you were at your lean body mass and you carried around an extra hundred pounds, it would really be problematic, uh, and you would tell yeah. it. Anyway, let's just bust, let's just bust that myth that you don't have to you don't have to lose weight to relieve blood pressure, get out of chronic pain, and other factors of ill health. I, I I agree with you. You can relieve it. What I what I would say is, but as you also said, there's a lot of reasons too. And and I simplified it when I said weight. What you really want to do is is fat, you know, because and because it's it's a lot of the fat that causes the problem. But what are the some of the reasons for the the fat, the fat is you you know about that brown fat that's in people can talk to people. It talks to them in terms of the hormones that it produces and puts out there, the stress that it causes on that. So there's reasons to it. So I agree with you. There there are ways to alleviate your challenges that you have. Aside from that, but also a good long term, as you mentioned, for longevity, for overall performance, and for and for other health reasons, it's good too. Because it's every pound, and actually this is a pound, every pound of weight um, is is equal that you have on your joint, and when you walk on it, it's equal to four pounds of prep, four pounds of pressure. So why put that extra stress on your body if it's if 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 it's not necessary, and, there, you know, and why put that extra stress on your on your heart and your blood volume if you don't have to? You know that one. Uh, but Bernard's got another. Bernard, go ahead. Well, I know it's only about three minutes left, but I was just one quick question for you all: Can hypertension still occur if you are proactive um, in this space and you know consider yourself doing things that? Uh, should limit it. Is there still ability for it to occur? At what percentage? And give me some suggestions of what you all, you know, each three of you all individuals would think are some of the most important things uh, to do when it comes to relieving or kind of stopping hypertension in its tracks. What, what would be the number one thing you all would suggest? Go ahead, Dr. B. In my opinion, if somebody wants to stop hypertension in its tracks, they have to do a variety of things. Some of, in my view, some of the most important things are to do the effective muscle release strategies to release muscles that are in excess contraction, to relieve the pressure on the peripheral microcirculation, uh, future visioning for being a person who is free, free of high blood pressure, has normal blood pressure, has a great cardiovascular system, and other future visioning components that uh, someone can construct with the right guidance, which is one of the things that I do and others do that too. Uh, so there's effective muscle release, there's future visioning, and then there's guided meditation. There's a whole, you know, knowing how to relax yourself, to interrupt automatic stress reactions, automatically interrupt automatic patterns that are destructive for health. And if people are doing those three things, and then of course, incorporating some others like proper diet, which would be really valuable, getting some exercise like we talked about, all important. But those first three things I mentioned, I think personally are the most important to help somebody uh, reverse blood pressure because most people haven't tried this. They tried all kinds of other things to do and they haven't tried those three. So if, if somebody comes to me and they, they, they have not tried those three things or haven't tried at least one or two of them, then I'm going to take them through that and we're going to be effective at reversing their high blood pressure. So, Dr. Bob, how much of it is hereditary, though? You know, how much do, does it come from your family and you you just kind of got those genes? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question, Greg. Uh, so so I I started out a strong proponent of genetic inheritance. Now, 
because of because we know the gene my gene expression can be modified on the fly actually uh, with individuals. I'm I'm more in line now with behavioral inheritance. Everybody sits around the dinner table uh, together and eats the same way. They learn how to communicate the same way. They learn how to walk. You know, kids walk after the parents. You can see a, a man walking down the street or a woman walking down the street, and their kid is walking just like them. I guarantee you, it's mostly dysfunctional. So I I ascribe a lot to behavioral inheritance, and also uh, if so, if somebody says I'm I'm genetically determined to have this thing, then if they think that way, then that, there's almost nothing that could ever help them. So that's the part of future visioning. Uh, and I've taken people with heavily genetically oriented uh, conditions like essential tremor, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very he uh, heavily uh, genetically based. So, and I've gotten them out of uh, essential, uh, uh, the, I've gotten them out of the, um, the shakes basically. So I'm, I'm, I don't like to even think of something as I have a strong genetic predisposition for this because we know people who, uh, uh, their parents had type 2 diabetes and they watched themselves uh, and, and they didn't ever got type 2 diabetes because they were careful. They lived the lifestyle that we're talking about. Yeah. So that's my yeah. take on that, Greg. Thanks for asking. No, I think that's a good good, uh, a good thing to, to think about too, that because we can get into that mindset that, that oh no, this is just going to happen to me and we've got to get out of that and, and break, mm -hmm. break free of it. But, you know, one thing that, that I will disagree with that is absolutely inherent is that uh, Dr. Bob, if your parents didn't have kids, neither would you. <laughs> uh, let me see. Can I argue that? I don't think I can argue that, Brad. <laughs> the, the one, the one thing that I can actually get in there that Dr. Bob can't argue with and have a, a more scientific expression on. So that's right. And so that's so Bernard. I think you know to your to your query, and I I agree. Find myself agreeing with Dr. Bob. I don't want to say that that uh, DNA dictates, but certainly even if even if you're doing all the, a lot of the things that we talk about and most of the things we're talking about, you still could develop that, uh, that um, hypertension from a hereditary factor. And so then you've got to have other, potentially other ways of controlling it. And you might have to go to uh, the medication route to do it uh, if the other ways don't work. Then I'd also then do agree. And then, and then, you know, another factor that comes up, you Although, you know, one would help that medita meditation would help with stress. The guided visualization Bob talks about exercise would help with stress. But even if even if you're if you're doing part of eating right, exercising, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, the stress gets out of control, that's you still got the hypertension. So that's where I also find myself agreeing with Dr. Bob this week on um, it's an integrated approach. You've got to have that integrated approach to really keep this thing under control, uh, diet, exercise, the mental aspects of it, um, and as part of the lifestyle things that Breck talked about. I used to be being a Nebraskan and a wrestler, Breck. You know that's why I brought up that chewing tobacco, which you didn't really go into. I used to we used to do that to stop eating when I was a lightweight wrestler to avoid weight wrong, and I and I developed a habit for a while on that, um, and and. That, that that's what had me at borderline hyper obsessive for a while. When I cut that out, I find it going down. So it's all those things. And then that's when I was, uh, you know, I had been measured at six, six at that point, 6% body fat. I wasn't under, under stress. I was working out four times a day, but mm -hmm. I, but I was, chew, I was chewing tobacco and that tobacco put me over the, over the edge. So it's, it's gotta mm -hmm. be an integrated, uh, continual integrated approach. But what I will also say on that is to, um, and when you're taking that integrated approach, it's not just good for your hypertension. It's good for your overall well-being, for your health, for your performance. So you'll reap many other benefits, you know, from taking that integrated approach. Yeah. You, you, you guys said two very important things that I took away from this. Two different topics. That 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 uh, dysfunctional behavior inheritance is something that you know I I don't think I've ever even thought of or dove into. I think that's amazing to think about as it relates to the topics you all are talking about in, in mindset improvement. Um, and those two things, I think, do go hand in hand with the ability to, uh, you know, fight or challenge hypertension. I think improving those two things and at least even having that thought, dysfunctional behavior inheritance is uh, yeah. very, very important in my opinion or something that I, you know, I'm glad you all made me aware of that I think does cross paths with 
you know, some of the things that, you know, create a lineage of issues for a particular family, et cetera. So that, that's great. That's great. Okay. Correct. Any, anything you'd like to, thank you for that, Bernard. Anything you'd like to add, Brett? No, just want to thank everybody that, uh, that tuned in live on TikTok, and and I'm glad we ran out of time and and didn't get to my, uh, you know, what my exercise routine. I feel a little inferior when I'm talking to a, a couple of uh, D1 athletes and a former pro uh, athlete. I'm like, well, God, you guys are far superior in your uh, athletic training than than I ever was. But yeah, it's something important to continue on in yeah. life, right? And and continue to to find healthy, fun, constructive ways to get out and, and uh, get some exercise. And I, I think you're even, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tweak Bernard here a little bit. Who's the pro athlete case, a former pro athlete case. Linda Noah. I think you're fitter than Bernard is now, Brad. You know? <laughs> well, I didn't, I probably didn't. Well, take you absolutely are. You I, absolutely I didn't take are. as much wear and tear on my body as he did either too. So, uh, you know, when, uh, when we were doing a couple of marathons uh, a, um, a year, my wife and I, you mm -hmm. know, that takes a toll, you know, kind of wears on those joints a little bit. So I can only imagine playing the, the schedule that uh, Bernard had in, in his uh, NBA days and, and uh, trying to recover and get mm -hmm. right back out there and do it again. It, it takes its toll. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and on that, uh, you know, I'd like you, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I think also that we, um, yeah, I think this one, given how prevalent it is and given we, I think we just kind of scratched the surface of the discussion. Uh, and often I think there's been a couple of times people have said, I wish you would spend, I wish you would spend even a couple of, a couple of weeks diving into these things. I think there's a lot more for us to really talk about and hypertension and have the impact and advice. So I, I, I think we'll revisit this again, you know, next week, if that's all right with you as well, uh, Brett. Yeah, we, we definitely have more we could cover. We didn't even get into some of the medications that you should be aware of. You know, if you've been prescribed a medication that doesn't have anything to do with blood, mm -hmm. blood pressure, all of a sudden now you see a spike in your blood yeah. pressure. So we should we should probably bring that to everyone's awareness that there are some specific, you know, even over the counter medications that you need to be aware of if you are dealing with trying to keep your, your um, you know, blood pressure lower, not have hypertension. There's, you know, there's some pretty common medications you need to stay away from. All right. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Thank you for everyone who joined us today on the WellWave Now interactive podcast. Thanks for joining on YouTube, TikTok, and Zoom. We appreciate you attending and mark your calendar for every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern. We'll have a wellness discussion here on this same uh, channel. You can follow live if on TikTok here or uh, follow the link below if you're on, um, on YouTube. You can find that link for next week's Well Wave Now discussion. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.